Welcome back to The Provisionist Perspective, where we want you to be firmly convinced of God's love and provision for everyone. We're going a little bit off of our usual these days. If you're new to the channel, we often talk about kind of the Calvinism, Arminianism, theological debate. We're both provisionists, which if you don't know what that is, click around some of our videos and you can find out. But this, this episode spawned as a result of a question that I asked Eric as a result of this, this interaction that I had with someone online who was basically saying that or implying that Calvin didn't self-promote or that Arminius didn't self-promote or something. So it led me to ask this question kind of, well, how did Calvin become so incredibly influential and popular such that his works are so well known and well distributed and so on. And Arminius, James Arminius, no one's read anything by him hardly ever hardly anyone points to the original sources of arminius's writings and so on and so i asked this question to eric about how did you know how did calvin rise to power and he's gone on a on a rabbit hole <laughs> and we get to read the benefits of that rabbit hole so i'm excited today we're, we're going to learn together i don't know much at all about the subject so i'm i'm really interested to learn yeah, I'm kind of a history nerd. I, I grew up uh, with a dad who has a PhD in history, uh, history teacher, and we would spend vacations going to Civil War battlefields. Bro, that's what, that's my that's my uh, yeah. That's what we would do. But we would fly to the. I'm East from North Coast. Carolina though, so you know. No, we would fly we to the East Coast. Yes. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I've Have been, to, been Gettysburg. to Gettysburg. Oh yeah, oh. I've been to Gettysburg. I've I've been to Antietam. Um, I've been, where, where else? There's another one I've been to recently just went to Port, Port Smith in Louisiana. Mm. And so I, I grew up a history nerd, uh, reading all kinds of history. Just, I, I have the history bug. And so anytime I, I read history for fun, it's a, it's a illness, but he asked me a historical question. I pulled out one of my books and uh, this book that I chose, I took an elective class on church history <laughs> and I just wanted nerd. to, what and it was nerd. on the history of the reformation. Cause I'm just a nerd and I could have taken something else, <laughs> but I, I chose yeah. more history. Uh, Around the and... time that we, we very first started this podcast, you were reading something massive on Luther, weren't you? Yeah, no, I, yes, his, you can kind of see it. It's peeking out right there, right there oh, yeah. is Luther's, uh, um, commentary. Yeah. Yeah. By Lyndall Roper. Lyndall Roper is, is not commentary. I'm sorry. Biography. Um, okay. the, around the f 500th anniversary of the reformation, a bunch of Luther biographies came out and I chose, and I read that one. So it's great stuff. Uh, this is from, uh, this book, uh, by Carter Lindbergh. Carter Lindbergh, uh, the European Reformations. We can put an Amazon link uh, in the description below there. Uh, so you can check. This is where all the uh, I did my research. I just dove right in and skimmed over things and, and refreshed uh, my memory and, and learned, learned some things. So the question was, how did Calvin gain power? And the short answer to that, and we're, we're going to go through the background here, but the short answer to that is because he lived in a different world than we do. The world that he uh, was born into was a changing world, completely unrecognizable to us. Now, what do I, what do I mean by that? If you're going to understand at all, what follows, by the way, is not going to be a complete condemnation of John Calvin. You would expect that from us if you know anything about us. I'm not going to sit there and condemn. I'm going to give the background. I'm going to give the facts of uh, how he gained his influence and his power in Geneva. And then you can, I'll give the example of the Servetus case. Uh, and then you can make up your own mind. We'll, we'll discuss it a little bit. And uh, I think there's, it's, it's compli history is complicated. History is complicated. So in order to understand any of this, Drew, you have to imagine yourself in a different world, a world that no longer exists. And cut to that. Yes. And we should Showing be wearing age a little bit here. Wearing, I don't know what hats did they wear back then. I don't no, know. that's the flashback. That's the flashback sound. That's not really imagine, anyways. Yeah. Okay. So imagine, <laughs> do, 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 do. imagine yourself in a world steeped in the ideal that 
the world ought to be a Christian community under the leadership of the Pope. That if, if I was to ask you, Drew, maybe we should do it this way. Drew, if I was to ask you what the purpose of the Christian life is and, and how the church supports that purpose, off the top of your head, doesn't have to be all scholarly or anything, but what would you say? I would say that the purpose of the Christian life is to glorify God. Um, but then in my mind, a large part of that is sharing faith, making disciples, and then the church's responsibility is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry is what I would say. Like, a, okay. like the good evangelist that I'm, that I aspire to be. Great. Great. That ideal that ethic did not exist in in the time of the Middle Ages. That's not how they viewed the world. They didn't view mm -hmm. Christianity as this sort of um, effort into personal piety. Uh, and maybe you even wouldn't use the word personal piety, but the term personal piety. But I think that's kind of what you're describing is that I'm going to live my life for the glory of God and I'm going to do all I can to bring others to live that life. Mm, and yeah. they would not have viewed the world that way or the church that way. Here's how they viewed the world. And I'm talking, what I'm talking specifically about is eighth, ninth century through to where the reformation began uh, is they viewed the world, uh, the, the ideal world was a Christian community under the leadership of the Pope. The Pope crowned kings and emperors, and there was an international global community headed by the vicar of Christ, and that was the goal of Christianity and the purpose of life was to be in good standing with this, and here's the term, corpus Christianum. So this is the Latin, corpus Christianum. The international the community body of christians of sure. christianity yeah. yes but the the idea meant the body of christ okay but what the we mean something totally different than the body of christ when when they sure. said it when they said it was the international community of christians under the authority of the vicar of christ hmm. and that was the pope you can imagine then if the goal of the Christian life is to be a part of this global Christianity, this global Christian community under the vicar of Christ, the authority of the vicar of Christ. You can imagine that individual piety or, or even nation states with distinct borders and their own sovereign authority didn't, mm. that doesn't really fit into that idea. Before we, get fully into this though. So, so imagine that world. Now imagine us looking back on that world and trying to describe it. So this is the job of historians, right? The job of historians is to look back at all the writings and all the art, the art and every, all the pieces of evidence that we have, the historical evidence that we have and sort of interpret it for the contemporary context that they're speaking to. And we've been doing histories for hundreds of years. Uh, but there is this, what's called a Eusebius model. And the Eusebius model looking at church, uh, looking at history, and I, I want to talk about this for a second because I'm going to poke at some of your, maybe Drew and the audience, some of your assumptions about history, about doing history, the practice of history. Mm. And there is this popular version called the Eusebian model of, of, the, of the history of the Reformation. And which, Eusebius was a, was a, histori uh, a, a scribe, like a historian of that yes. time. Yes. Isn't he the, is Eusebius the bot that we have on our, on our patron discord mm -hmm. or is that a different? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. That's right. Yeah. So you can tell Eusebius to like quote a confession or to quote the Bible or whatever, and it'll, it'll yeah. throw it up in there. That's a discord <laughs> bot. He's an yeah. actual guy. I don't know how you feel about that right now, turning over in his grave, but <laughs> he had this model and it was based, popularized for hundreds of years. And I think it's still really, when I describe it, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, that's what I believe. 
<laughs> there's this uh, mainline version of the Reformation, which views it as a pure return to the doctrines of the early church. That the right. history of the church is, well, you have the ancient times up to the fourth century, the medieval period of decay until the 15th century, and then this new period of recovery of the gospel. Mm. This is a Eusebian model. So the Eusebian model makes normative the early Christian period and then sees every development after that as a degradation. Mm. The problem with that is, is that it's just as much, like all history, it's just as much influenced by the historian's perspective as is the historical data. So you, look, so if you're a child of the Reformation and, the, and of Protestantism, like we are, we look back and go, oh yeah, our version's better. <laughs> and right. so we interpret history in that way. So you're saying that this model viewed viewed the early, like from fourth century before as mm. like the model. Mm. And then there have been degradation from that point forward until the Protestant Reformation. And then it's kind of been on the upward climb since then. Is that or maybe not. I I think maybe you would say, oh, it's downward back again now. But the height of returning to the gospel was the Reformation. And they figured right. they rediscovered the solas and and we've been seeing tweets about this recently online which i think is probably why this is in our brain and i just i just have to say <laughs> there is this one there's a tweet from a from a guy named uh Gabe in Texas there in Dallas i think he's in Dallas uh Calvinist pastor and he said something to the effect of, of Protestant Christianity is the true Christianity or something right. like that just biblical christianity and then, and then somebody commented underneath that and said, you know, yeah, but it's, yeah, but not reformed. Reformed isn't true Christianity, <laughs> not, not reformed Protestantism, in other words, or Calvinism. So that, and so then that, he right. went, and then he went on underneath that to say, no, it is the Bible teaches it, yada, yada. And I thought, I thought, you know, this post, this original tweet would have really hit different if he had said Calvinism is true, you know, it's true Christianity. <laughs> I thought, I wonder how many likes he would have gotten on this if he had said this a little bit different. But anyways. That's reflective of this model of seeing history in that way. And now I want to be clear. I'm not saying that's totally wrong. I'm not saying, you know, eject that from your mind. I'm asking, just asking you to question it. Dear listener, please just have an open mind and question that assumption as we go through this, as you do your own study on the Reformation. It's not as uh, what I, uh, the bold claim that I'll make is that it's just it's not as easy and pure clean as the driven snow as we tend to think it is that mm. as we'll see it as just as much of a product of social economic and political upheaval as it is some sort of pure theological return to the gospel okay right there were there were great benefits and costs of changing and moving theologically during this time politically power, all the different stuff. That's right. In other words. That's right. The other problem with viewing things in this way is what you're doing, and people just do this all the time, is it contemporizes the past. It's uh, presuming that the ancients that we are lionizing, like the, you know, the ancients that we're deifying kind of, were similar to us, had similar hmm. concerns to us. Hmm. It, it's sort of assuming that. And in, in other words, you're dumping your contemporary concerns onto the ancients and then using their words to solve your contemporary problems. <laughs> everyone was doing this with Augustine during the Reformation. And everyone's been doing it with Augustine since. And it's interesting because if you think about Augustine, he was around a thousand-ish years before the Reformation. And we're about 500-ish years removed from the Reformation forwards, obviously. And that's like a, that's a big distance of five, 500 years is a lot, but then a thousand years, that's right. double the distance we are from the Reformation. And then to think that you would use Augustine, who's writing about in a particular theological milieu, and then saying, here's what he meant with regards to our situation here would be anachronistic for sure. So, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's anachronistic. I understand the drive to do it. We have to have a little epistemic humility here, right? That we're looking at these things through goggles. That doesn't mean we don't look. 
It just means yeah. to recognize that we have goggles on and to hold some of these things lightly, uh, willing to be corrected or shown a different point of view on this. So that's all I'm hoping for our listeners, for, for our watchers here, that the things you've thought about the Reformation, hold them a little bit lightly and try to look at this from a, I'm going to go broad with this perspective here. I'm just going to take kind of a sampling of a summary of what I've been reading in here again. And I made an outline and we're going to, we're going to go through it. And hopefully I can explain the culture in which the history in which Calvin was able to gain power in a city uh, and how hit, why his writing survived is probably another topic for another day, but we'll get to why he, he gained the power that he did. Mm. So the late medieval period that is marked by the reformation and, and, and the kind of the pre-reformation era and those things that happened is one of crisis. Now, we're often taught to think of it as just one of complete upheaval and everything was terrible. The famous Hobbes, the famous Hobbes quote is in part, life is nasty, brutish, and short. So we're, we're taught to think of the late middle medieval period. And it's even called, right? What is, what are the other names for it? It's called the middle ages, meaning there's this period of awesomeness. Then there's like this middle period. And then we get to the the Reformation and the Enlightenment and everything's better again. Whereas this middle period, uh, we don't want to talk about that. Life was uh, brutish and short there. The medieval period is kind of the most charitable way we can talk about it, much less the Dark Ages, much less the Middle Ages. Those are just have these revisionist history. You're judging it before you're even talking about it just by the name you're calling it. Hmm. So it was a time of crisis, but not everything was terrible all the time. We're going to go on to talk about all the terrible things <laughs> because that led to the changes. That led to the changes. It's just some people's lives were really, th there were people living in small villages and out in farms and everything like that. They just lived their lives and none of this really touched them. But it was enough of a change that really entire history changed, society changed during this period of time. Okay. One of the first things to talk about here is the economic development. You had in, in the pre-Reformation era leading up to uh, Luther's birth, you had for the first time kind of a, a development of money currency. And this came from technological advance, advancements in like metallurgy, metallurgy and um, smelting powders and blasting powders. So you can actually go into mines and act, go deeper than they've ever been to be able to, to before mm. and get metals out and then purify them with these kind of primitive smelting techniques that they had, but they were able to do it. And it developed into money currency. Before mm. that, there was no capitalism. This is kind of a pre-capitalism where there was currency and then people s said, oh, well, if I have a currency, I can buy things with a currency. I can make things and people will buy them and then give me some of that. This is when that's, this kind of started. What this has to do with our story is that this is one of the things that made, made Frederick the wise, rich and powerful. And with that money from the mining being done on his, in his kingdom, uh, as small as it was, he founded the University of Wittenberg, which is where a young uh, professor named Martin Luther began teaching. And Frederick the Wise is famous for being Luther's patron, who after the Diet of Worms ha uh, hid Luther in his castle. And during the period of months where Luther was hiding, because the Catholics were out looking to arrest him and kill him, put him on trial and, and burn him at the stake, uh, he was hiding in this castle. He wrote, I think, most of his Luther's Bible, his very famous Luther's Bible that's still used in Germany today. Along with these technological advancements came military advancements, gunpowder specifically. It was developed, gunpowder for firing cannon was developed from these mining blasting powders. So they, what? 
So, so they start, so in the development of technology, they discovered that they could blast out these mines and then gain, you know, better, deeper resource, or just, you know, drill deeper, get better resources. And then they purpose that to be like, Hey, we can shoot a big ball out of a cannon and yes. kill some people with this. Yes. What this did is it made eventually it made the night obsolete. So the knight was this highly trained, highly specialized, very expensive soldier who really only the, the nobles right. got it. I don't, I was like the night, the night is obsolete because it's, it's nighttime and then you have gunpowder <laughs> and it makes light and it's absolutely okay. The knight. <laughs> the knight from in, now on. In that's terms of warfare, right. In terms of warfare, it made the night obsolete. Uh, the knights were highly trained, highly specialized, and very expensive. So really only the nobles and kings and popes could afford them. But now any militia with a cannon could take down a knight, which in a sense decentralized military power that if you had a few cannon and some mercenaries, you could wage war. Uh, and it also made, if peasants were able to get a hold of some of these cannons, it made it easier for peasants to result. revolt. And, and kill knights. So knights were now absolutely, you had cannon, you had more peasant revolts. The, this, this stuff went on a, a lot more now. In other words, you, you, you once had these like special forces that were like knights that you just can't stop them. And then suddenly this new tech was developed where, you know, you can just bust the cap in a special forces dude and just... Yeah, uh, if a peasant was to get a hold of a long sword and knight armor, what would he do with it? Nothing. He has no clue what to do with it. Yeah. Uh, cannon? <laughs> That's easier. Right. <laughs> point, right. point it, put the powder in, put the ball in, point it, and shoot it. Right. This, of course, w later when you know muskets were developed, uh, that changed everything too. As all this changed, what also happened was people began moving more into the cities. So you had these people who owned mines. Luther's father owned a mine. And they would send their kids to the cities to get schooling in the universities. Lawyers, doctors, theologians. And this led to more urbanization. This led to more development of universities, private universities outside of Catholicism, outside the church, I should say. And so you had these private universities funded by private money, which had never really existed before. All of it was the church's money. And this led to growth in cities. So instead of some cities having populations in the thousands, cities began having populations into the tens of thousands. Also, not just nobles, but merchants can now gain wealth and power through a money economy. So there was this new wealth and Luther's family was a direct beneficiary of this new wealth. So you had more people, not a lot, but you had more people climbing out of poverty and living in comfort and being able to send their sons to become white collar, I guess what we would call now workers, uh, you know, your, your, right. your scholars. This led to even more changes, both morally and spiritually. And of, of course, politically, political problems as well. If I can get as rich as the nobility, what is so noble about them? Hmm. Right. If, if the purpose of life is to be a part of this corpus Christianum and the authority to be in the church comes from God to the vicar of Christ, to his cardinals, to his bishops, to everything like, to the priests. And that is a God-given top-down authority that I need to respect. That's one way of viewing the world. If, however, within my effort and ingenuity, I can blast a mine open, become just as rich and powerful as some noble or bishop, maybe authority and power aren't from God in that way. Hmm. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, that would be a really interesting paradigm shift. And it's something that we would really take for granted in our own individual you know, capitalist society in the sense that, and, and I think this is, this is one of the things we went on a long rant that I'm sure just everybody tuned out on one time about, it wasn't a long rant, but we talked a little bit about the queen of England and how you're, you know, you're a bit, you know, up on the, on the news with the royalty in the UK and stuff and how, and the, us Americans, we just, we're just like, Oh, royalty, we're just the nobles. We don't care. You know, whereas this would have been very much in the minds of the, you know, I guess pre-reformational, reformational. This, yeah, that's the people. world. The world that they lived in, and and furthermore, mm -hmm. the world that they lived in was those knights and knight. Uh, those kings were crowned by the Pope. Hmm. The emperor over the whole empire was crowned by the Pope. Hmm. And so you have this top-down view of authority from God. Uh, you can imagine that royals and princes many of them did not like this change some embraced it and and saw opportunity in it to consolidate their power against maybe the greater princes and royals frederick the wise who is luther's patron but lots of them so, didn't so like frederick it. the wise was mm -hmm. the and i'm just i'm gonna be like you guys listeners you're maybe you're more up to it on history and stuff i just you know, so for me, Frederick the Wise. So this is like the king of Germany. Yeah, really, there is no Germany. He's a he's a noble in the region that Luther and his family were in, that, and then he sponsored this university, which then Luther right. went to. Yes, and is this and it is creating or sponsoring a university that's not part of the church that is is that viewed as seditious in that time? That's kind of like undermining. Or, you know, because because I could see how and I'm just sort of, you know, off the cuff here, but I could see how even in our own context, we could see the like, that's the secular, the secularists, they're building a university and they're going to train up the godless or something like that. Was that kind of, you know, how that was viewed then? I, I think that there would be some royals and nobles and, and the papacy that would view it that way. Uh, there would be a lot there would be a lot of pushback. Uh, against teachings that went against the papacy, and there was, and that's—I mm. mean, right—that's that's the what, what happened here. And one of the things that paved the way, yes, were these private universities. Now, I think a lot of people would view these universities as an opportunity to get money from them, to be a part of them, and so I don't. Th there wasn't this. There wasn't a, as far as I've read, there wasn't a uniform push against these universities. It wasn't like the papacy sure. tried to stop them. Sure. There's, I could see how, and, and we're going to get into this right now. I could see how they really couldn't do anything about it. It just started happening. Right. Uh, um, but to finish out what was going on in the cities and these universities being a part of these cities. And, and we, we kind of, we kind of see a city in a very different way. Uh, uh, and I'm not even sure if I know how to describe this, but like a big city has what, you know, a professional sports team or two. It has what really tall buildings and, you know, maybe a huge corporation is based there. And so we're like, Oh yeah, that's a big city. But the center of a city would have been its cathedral and its university back then. Hmm. If you wanted to found a city, if you wanted Wittenberg to grow, you find a you found a university there, and you attract young scholars, and you get them to write books. So the cities would be fighting during this time. The cities would be fighting internal and external enemies. So there'd be some criminality in the cities. There'd be uh, poverty issues in the cities. But then they would also fight external enemies. Cities would actually fight each other. We'll, we'll get into that in a second. Um, what, but the, what they would were finding is that their problems in the cities weren't being solved by the papacy. That the traditional values and structure 
of the papacy wasn't addressing them. Hmm. There's wasn't poverty, meeting their felt needs. Not their felt. Oh gosh, you're going to trigger me with that term, felt needs. Oh my gosh. <laughs> there's poverty. There's war. There's famine, and the papacy just isn't concerned. It seems like to them. Hmm. Now, what this led to? Well, if the and, vicar of and for, for just to, sorry to interrupt, when you say the papacy isn't concerned, that would much be like uh, that's not the same as our oh well the church isn't really helping out the poor they're not really doing anything in their minds it's the government yes is not helping the people the people that care. right. If my, and I'm going to get into exactly how this is. You're going to see how bad this got. If my life is supposed to be about being a part of the global Christian community as headed by the Pope, and yet my life is not good, and that structure isn't helping me, sure. then what is the purpose of it? Hmm. Now, I'm just talking about the economic stuff and the social stuff that was going on. What this began was the, the process of, and this took decades, hundreds of years for this to really uh, come into full swing. But where their thoughts went, the collective thoughts went, was, well, if the top-down papacy, this, that hierarchical structure from God, isn't helping us with our actual problems, and they're not listening, it seems like, then we need to solve them on our own. Now, some of the answers were rebellion. Some of the answers were reform. Some of the, thus begun nation building. So city-state building, nation building is what started going on here. Now, again, lots of setbacks, lots of barriers, took lots of time. But as Luther was a young professor in Wittenberg, this was going on. But here's the main thing. And, and we're, we're already touching on it, but let me get specific here. The main thing here was this crisis of values. So since the 8th and 9th centuries, the church held to the doctrine of the divine right of the Pope to crown kings and control them. And the Pope could remove their kings, if remove their crowns if the situation required it. But during a pe period of nation building and national identity, in France specifically, France was where this began, uh, this led to the discovery of Pope Boniface VII in the early 14th century that he could not control the king of France, that he hadn't crowned that king, the nation of France had, and so he had no control over that king. In other words, they had built a nation state. They had crowned their own king who he didn't crown. And then suddenly he was like, I can't control this guy. Worse still, yes, worse still, long story short, independent from the papacy, French wealth and power influenced the papacy. And the French actually succeeded in moving the center of the papacy from Rome to Avignon. Oh, so, so at some stage... The Vatican was in France. Was in France essentially. It wasn't vet. It wasn't the Vatican. It was Avignon. <laughs> hmm. Right. Interesting. So in in so here so then what here's what happened in 1378, after some Pope election shenanigans, and some and social pressure from the mob in Rome, the cardinals who had elected this new Pope, uh, Urban VI. They elected Urban VI. Afterwards, they one by one slipped out of Avignon, convened in Rome, and declared that Urban was not duly elected. Urban VI was not duly elected. We should consider the papacy vacant. And they elected a new Pope, Pope Clement VII. So there are basically two popes now. One that's okay, considered right, illegitimate. Of course, and one that's, okay. Urban the Sixth yeah. didn't go quietly into the night. <laughs> right. 
Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Urban the Sixth wasn't like, oh, all oh, right. Okay, I'll you be. elected him. Okay, that's all right. I'll see you later. Right. <laughs> oh, you want me to abdicate? I'm going to step okay. down in humility and just <laughs> didn't happen. Didn't happen. So he doesn't accept that. And he goes, oh, yeah, well, guess what? This new pope is excommunicated. And the new pope, Clement VII, goes, oh, yeah, well, you're excommunicated. <laughs> <laughs> no, you. Somebody pulls out a re Uno reverse card. <laughs> no, you. So now there's two popes. Two popes. Again, imagine what this does. Okay, there's two popes. This situation continued for 40 years. That's my entire lifetime. It's a long time. Two popes throwing excommunications at each other for 40 years. Lots of books have been written about this. This is called the Western Schism, by the way. So if you want to go look this up uh, and read more about this, it's called the Western Schism. The papacy tried all kinds of things to solve this problem, and each one made things worse. <laughs> Actually, then one time, Actually, after a council in Pisa, there was actually a third pope <laughs> for a year. So they tried this, what was called um, conciliation or conciliatory. It was like this um, right. this doctrine of, no, let's get these other two guys to abdicate and then we'll get a third actual guy. And they tried this in Pisa. And so then uh, for one year before he died, there was a third pope. Was he killed or he just died? He died. He, just... he died. Okay. I, he got a second die. Okay. <laughs> so it, maybe as you can imagine, hopefully as you can, you can paint this picture, it, it can't be overstated how much this shameful state of affairs degraded the prestige and legitimacy of the papacy in the eyes of the average noble and Christian. Sure. Yeah. If it's supposed to be the global community under the vicar of Christ, but there's two of them and they hate each other. Yeah. Yeah, what does that mean about the yeah. thing itself? Hmm. So there were, so you may know the names Wycliffe yep. and Huss. Yeah, he's the he's the German. Is it Will? Will Huss? Yes. Will Hess. Are you listening? <laughs> there he is. Sorry, carry on. So Wycliffe and Huss, they were kind of um renewal movement guys they became loud critics of the claims of the papacy to have political power they were like this state of affairs obviously means that god if it was ever legitimate to begin with has removed the right of political power from the papacy hmm. now those movements didn't gain the ground that luther's did for reasons but this was all going on and Wycliffe, I, I always get confused because there's a few different guys that kind of get credit for this. But Wycliffe is most well known for the English, for like one of the first common English translations of the Bible, right? Yes. Yeah. The first vernacular, what we call the vernacular. So yeah. uh, the scriptures was always in Latin. Only priests and bishops learned Latin. The common people didn't speak it, didn't know it. And so the word, the word of God was held in the hands of the... Uh, magisterium. Uh, so you could, you, if you're looking at this from a political standpoint, you could see how translating the Bible into the vernacular would have been seditious. Hmm. Putting the, the Bible in the hands of the people, that's an act of political sedition. Right. Uh, and, and so Luther's Bible in German you know, was the same thing. Um, so all of these pressures that are on people, wars, famine, poverty, the growth of cities that led to urban problems, what that would do is that would lead them to look for meaning and structure in the church. But the church isn't there. The church is internally conflicted. They're trying to solve its own three pope situation, <laughs> which makes the whole purpose of their lives, the corporate Christian ethic that has existed all, all through their generations up until then, look kind of dumb. That just mm. doesn't work anymore. It's not real. There's two popes. So the question becomes, if religion and politics aren't about the corporate body of Christ living in harmony under the vicar of Christ, then what are they about? Right. So this began the idea that religion was primarily personal. So like at the beginning, when I asked you, what's the point of the Christian life? Sure. 
and you had a personal answer, this idea took decades, hundred years or so to develop, but that's the start of that idea. Hmm. How are we doing so far? Yeah, makes sense. It's interesting to think about how this would, would have provided fertile ground for, you know, reformation. I mean, change, Oof. you know, and, yes. and it's interesting how we talk about there. There's kind of a buzz phrase. And I saw a friend share an article on this about how he doesn't really like the phrase, but identity in Christ. And mm. it's kind of like the the upheaval that they're experiencing then their identity is being challenged. And so then when you when you start getting into this uh, justification, you know, being declared righteous by personal faith, coming into communion, reconciliation with God, mm. that is your identity, your security in Christ, then that can become, you know, quite, I can see how that's quite attractive. 100%, 100%. And then when you think about what happened with Luther, and we're going to kind of skip over Luther. And I understand that's a big skip. <laughs> that's that's kind of a, an Olympic sized long jump over Luther here. Uh, and if, if you like this stuff, comment below. Uh, let us know that you want a Luther episode. We'll do it. But we're going to jump over Luther a bit, except only to say that then when somebody comes around who has that crisis of personal faith, who sort of exemplifies what the body politic, I guess, what the common man was going through. Right. Period, uh, socially and spiritually, he has that crisis too. And then he, he develops in his skill of writing and oratory, he develops a, for, at first a, here's all the problems, 95 theses, right? Here's all the problems. I'm going to publicly, publicly proclaim them. Then he gets a wealthy patron with a castle who can protect him in Frederick the Wise. And then he learns the skill of this new technology called the printing press that didn't really, that didn't exist before, which is one of the main reasons other Reformation attempts failed. He was able to get these pamphlets out. And it's a combination of the printing press is very complicated. Uh, the, the printing press meaning uh, movable type that you could print lots of leaflets or books at once. So These the type the first, was moving. Uh, the first gospel tracks. The first gospel tracks. And then it was this sort of thin fly paper that was first developed. So it wasn't mm. um, really expensive papyrus or really expensive. Uh, it was made of vellum made from she uh, sheepskins, mm. vellum. Mm. That stuff was really, really expensive, but this was like this um, flypaper that they were able to develop. So another technical advancement, and then the ink. They developed a cheap ink. All of these things combined to make Luther's Re Reformation successful. Let's skip ahead to Calvin. Okay. This is the good stuff. All of this continues. Nation states are being built. Cities are gaining uh, independence. Reformation is being brought to cities and nation states and there's all of this conflict and some cities are becoming decidedly catholic and kicking out all the lutherans whether exiling them or killing them and and killing them in the streets and that stuff happened or becoming decidedly lutheran and then and then in zurich there was a reformation under zwingli where there became reformers and so that was a separate Thing besides Luther. Luther was too conciliatory for the reformers <laughs> uh, and they were a bit more radical. And so there was that going on in Zurich, which is, uh, is Swiss in Switzerland. And that was happening. And um, Calvin came out of all of this. He is a French lawyer trained in law, beginning of the 16th century, Geneva, a town in Switzerland, was struggling for independence from the House of Savoy in between France and Italy, this House of Savoy. Geneva was actually attacked by the House of Savoy and was defended by some other more powerful Protestant city-states. So they had friends that were city-states that had become Protestant. There were other city-states around them that were Catholic. The House of Savoy, which was backed by the French king, uh, wanted to maintain power over them. So there was upheaval and chaos from within the Catholic and Protestant citizens of Geneva. And then 
you, you know, warfare sometimes, but pressure from political pressure from without. Okay. This was all going on when Calvin first went to Geneva. He wasn't even supposed to stay there. He was going to stay there for one night. And then he was uh, persuaded to stay and bring reform, help bring reforms to Geneva. He was going to go on to Strasbourg. So the so what is the so if we can say in brief I don't want to you know belabor points too long because I I know we've got some ground to cover but but what is the so Calvin's arrives in Geneva what what is he what's he there for he was going to Strasbourg actually and he was going to become uh, a he was kicked you history nerds are going to know what I'm talking about he was kicked out of where he was. I think it was in France because he was um, he was associated with a, a radical reformer and they didn't want him and they kicked him out. Him and lots of other people were kicked out as he was. Uh, there were all kinds of uh, at during this time as nation states and cities went through periods of time where they were Catholic went through periods of time where they were Lutheran went just, and, and going Protestant. Uh, people were moving in and out. Refugees would leave, refugees would go back. So this stuff was happening all the time. He was kicked out of where he was. He was going to go to Strasbourg and he was going to become a teacher there. He didn't want to be, become a political guy. He, his goal wasn't to become political. His goal was to go be um, a teacher and to help with the... Um, French refugees and to pastor and to teach. That's what he wanted to do. But he gets there and he's um, persuaded to stay to help with the mission of God in reforming Geneva. That's, hmm. that's the reason he stays is because he feels compelled by God to help in Geneva to bring reforms there. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yep, I think so. He was on he was on a mission to teach, and then people were like, "Hey, you're really capable. Why don't you stick around and help us with the movement here?" And then he was kind of like, "Cool." Right, right. There's there's background with his writings and his he he was not really a preacher at this time that he that he became that later, but he wasn't a trained theologian uh, or a trained preacher. He 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 was a lawyer. Uh, so his his teaching and his, and his writings had kind of preceded him, uh, but he wasn't world famous, powerful at this time yet. It's interesting too. A little little known fact about Calvin that I think is really interesting in these discussions. And I know it was a different world; the lifespan was shorter and stuff like that. But his first edition, from what I understand, of the Christian the Institutes of Christian Religion, where he published when he was nineteen. Yeah, and and right. And uh, I believe that's true. And the first edition of it, he just wanted it to be training for pastors. Hmm. He wanted it to be practical training stuff and not... As he developed his ideas and specifically the doctrine of predestination, that was challenged so much that he felt like he had needed to defend it and to rewrite and expand on the Institutes throughout time. And I think the institutes end up being 1500 pages long or something. Yeah. Uh, so the, fir the first edition uh, arguably was probably a lot shorter than what we have now, but it, no. but it is interesting to note that the very one first fourth edition the either. size, I think even yeah. smaller, maybe. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, so however, Calvin's first attempts to bring reform to Geneva ended him in being uh, expelled from the city. And he went to Strasbourg, which was a lot more of a tolerant city. If you're talking, so this was where the ideas of religious freedom kind of began. Because if I believe, again, it starts becoming a little bit more about personal piety. Now, not completely in the way that we would think of it, but I get to choose what part, what camp I get to be a part of. I can be a Lutheran or I can be a Catholic. And then as things developed, or oh, I can be a Protestant, I can be reformed. I can be these things. I can be an Anabaptist. These, and then your family's Anabaptist and you grow up Anabaptist. And, and these things start happening where people are leaving areas to go to other cities 
where they can be more free religiously to worship as they, as they see fit. This is a new development in human history. So Strasbourg was one of those cities where a lot of French Protestant refugees would go. And he spent three years there teaching and helping the French refugees, pastoring them. And he then was, okay. The question still is, however, is this. this is, let's return to this question. If the Christian life isn't about the top-down vicar of Christ, and we're all part of this structure as the global community of Christ, what is it then? We have to do this locally. What is it to be a part of the true biblical church? And every city and nation states were figuring this out relatively on their own, not on their own. That's, that's, that's not true. Lots of places influenced uh, diff different areas. And I don't have all that figured out. But, and there were areas that were more Catholic and areas that were more Lutheran and things like that. But they were having to kind of start from scratch here. So Calvin's reforms and what answering the question, what is it to be then a part of a local Christian community? What are the laws then? I don't think I've said this enough. Religion and politics are inexplicably linked here during this day. I, th right. I think that's clear, but I just want to say that. There is no secular politics. It doesn't exist. So when he, so when I'm answering, so when I'm asking the question, what is it to be a part of the church? I'm asking, what is it to be a part of this society? What are the laws governing this society slash the church? Mm. Because the center of every city was either a university or a cathedral a church. That was the center of their life. Okay. And in, in, in other words, if, if I can just chime in here, so... Yeah. So all of this happens. People are accustomed to the church, i.e., you know, the Roman Catholic Church. They make the rules. We follow them. We're part of this corpus Christi Christanum. I don't know how to say that word. You know, the you this it. body of worldwide Christians. There's disillusionment with that. There's reformation happening in different places. People ally themselves to different leaders in different spots. And it, but if I can make a prediction here. I would guess that competent leaders are emerging that aren't popes. And then the question in people's mind maybe is who tells us what to do now? Who's making the rules? Who's, you know, if it's not this pope, 100%, not pope, one, 100%. It? And then people in different areas, Strasbourg, Geneva specifically were like, okay, we don't want to trade one pope for another. So Calvin is asked to return to Geneva. He he gains the the um, he he gains the reputation and shows his competence in writing skill and managing thing. He's a trained lawyer of bringing reforms and, and knowing how to get things done. So they want that kind of thing. He becomes, his writings become more famous. His institutes become famous. And he, um, they want him for his name and for his competence. So he comes back, but not for his agreeableness. <laughs> How dare you? If Don't you, know, you dare. You know. All right. So he comes back to Geneva, it, but it isn't like there's opposition. So he starts enacting reforms and people are like, wait a minute. You're not going to just supplant the papacy. And now it's a Protestant Pope, mini Pope telling us what to do. No, no, no. We're going to have city officials that are independent from the church. So there's, there's pushback. There's families that go against Calvin. There's all this. So here comes the question. The question is, how does he gain power? He has this opposition. He's a lawyer, he's a trained lawyer, he's a teacher, he's a pastor. How does he gain this political power in Geneva? And especially in the face of some opposition. What he did was now, 
how to do history. This stuff is complicated. There's different schools of thought in this. Okay. Uh, what Carter Lindbergh lands on as he's trying to balance this is basically what Calvin did, did is he worked within the developing political system of Geneva and he wrote and or ghost wrote a lot of their new laws. He, he knew who to apply. He knew who to talk to. He knew how to get things done and he wrote their laws. And it's interesting as, as you talk about this, I've, I've read some things on this in the past and it's vaguely swimming around in my head, but you know, the question is, so if it's not pious, if it's not righteous to be part of this worldwide body of Christianity, then it, then it's pious to obey our Lord through submitting to the authorities that he's given to us. And then, and then Calvin is, is okay. What are the things that we should do that make us pious? And then people, I think, I can't remember exactly what they were, but apparently there were a number of very, <laughs> especially from our perspective, strict pious laws that he had put in place in Geneva to say, good Christians do this. And if you don't do this, we're coming at you. 100%. It gained the Geneva, gained the reputation for Puritanism and for strictness. How he did that, how that came about is a long, lots to discuss there. I don't even understand all of it. I think what's relevant here, and as we get to Servetus, and it's not just Servetus, <laughs> but as we get to that example, uh, I think what is what is relevant here is two ideas that drove this, and then among all the among all the things he instituted, one specific institution in Geneva that he that he created. Okay. These were meant to be, again, a different world, a different time. Put yourself in that place of a different world, different time. These were moral laws. They were laws for staying in good standing with the Genevan church. So they were ecclesiastical and political at the same time. Hmm. So, And not to mention that what that means to, in their minds, is obedience to God. Of course. I'm so glad you said that. Of course. Calvin believes that what he's doing is the best for the people as obedience to God, that he is convicted to reading the Bible in this way and that Christians should behave this way. And so we're going to enact laws in that direction. Mm -hmm. And we're going to support a Christian community that we want to be a part of uh, that behaves in this way. Right. And if that means that people who disobey those laws need to be punished. Well, that's just righteousness. Sure. Yeah. So you have this transformation from the global corpus Christianum to a local meaning and purpose. And in Calvin's mind, if you want to read him the best way you can, he sees it as towards sanctification and a healthy society. Right. Like, for, for instance, divorce was absolutely illegal in Geneva. If you were to tell me, if there was some politician today that was to run on the platform of making divorce illegal, I'm a one-issue voter. Vote for that dude. <laughs> I mean, all about it. So I'm sympathetic to some of those things where it's like, no, we have identified this as so harmful to society that we're willing to punish individuals who harm our society in this way. I'm sympathetic to that idea. Are you? And if you want to hear more on us on this subject, we do a whole episode on it. <laughs> right. So our first episode got a lot more views than the second one where we kind of field some Q and a, but, um, so, I mean, how are you doing with just in, in general the idea that divorce is so harmful to people and to society that we're going to make it illegal? And if you divorce your wife, you're going to jail. Like, is that totally immoral in your view? 
I don't think it's I don't think it's totally immoral, but I think it makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> okay, no, I, that's fair. I think, it makes me, sure. I, I and I think I, I mean I'm behind. You know, divorce is harmful. For those of you that have listened to our episode on this, we have. Yeah, we're not going to get into this now, but there there are there's some nuance and lengthy discussion to be had on this subject. If you have a concern, please go watch those episodes and then and then get back with us here us out and our on our full view on that. But I mean. You know, if there's anything that we're doing today is taking it far too lightly, <laughs> that's sure. that's for certain. That's, that's for, for certain. certain. So, that's for certain. Yeah. We are totally fine with uh, polygamy as long as you do it one after another, as long as you have that partner yeah. one after another. Yeah. But all right. But yeah, go go for our few, uh, for our full, hopefully nuanced view of that. Uh, go check that video out. So. One structure that I think leads us in the direction of understanding where Calvin, how Calvin gained this power, he he put into place a, and and when I say he, I don't mean Geneva was his fief and he was a king. I mean right. he was able to orchestrate support such that these structures were put in place. The most controversial and important for our purposes was th this thing called the consistory. He put into place this thing called the consistory. If you want to think of it as an ecclesiastical secret police or an ecclesiastical not so secret police, that's a good way of thinking about it. So this is like the the Protestant Gestapo. Yes. It, it was an ecclesiastical court that presided over law breaks, rule breaks, of per people's individual moral behavior. They're, they're the, they're the police in the sense that there, there are laws that have been put in place and then there are law enforcement like that. Somebody has to go and enforce the law. Otherwise the laws are pointless. 100, 100%. Now th this became controversial because they be, it, it started see, began, it started being seen as Calvin's personal arm to protect his power. So however it started, it, it was an art, it was the organ of church discipline in Geneva. It was the purpose of it in the writings. And if you want to take Calvin, positively, church discipline and political law enforcement, right? It, but it was social yeah. harmony, right? That right. if you were to say political law enforcement, well, the point of that is social harmony. Sure. Sure. I'm just saying that when people hear church discipline now, it's like, and right. you know this is so right. they're married. No, the, the power to jail you, <laughs> yeah, yeah, to exile you, to kill you, with with the power of the sword, right? So that was the point. But th there's actually one instance where a critic of Calvin, a man by the name of Amu, or uh, probably Amo, Amo, was forced to walk the whole of Geneva in a penitent shirt, begging for forgiveness. So he shamed this dude and totally defended the the ruling on his shaming and thought it was totally right because this guy was a, a critic of Calvin. Interesting. So, I mean, without getting into too much detail on, you know, what he was criticizing, it, it became not just he's violated the law of the land, but how dare you now go take the walk of shame and beg for forgiveness kind of thing. There are, as far as I understand it, there are thousands of court cases that this consistory over the years, over the decades, uh, adjudicated on. And only relatively a handful of them have been translated and and gone through. And y y you have adultery, you have... Um, a pastor being uh, excommunicated for uh, sexual harassment. You have things like that. But but what you have frequently, again, small sample size out of all that they have, uh, trans out of all they have, they've only translated a small sample size. But you have over and over again, you have several punishments for criticizing Calvin. So it's not, it's not just that they found one. Among the many that have been, among the few, relatively speaking, that have been translated, but that there have been several where people are punished <laughs> for criticism. I, 
this sounds so familiar. This is just like, how dare you criticize us? <laughs> yeah, let me let me see. This is really interesting, I feel, because I mean, I guess this basically is just a reflection on what happens when you have a lot of power and influence and a fragile ego. I don't know. <laughs> not not accustomed to being the person who's being critiqued or pushed back against or Whatever. But I think it's it's you're, viewing you're in among the you're in the hegemony and then somebody comes yes. at you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think he would view it as I'm administering these things for God. An attack upon my doctrine is an attack upon the authority of God, the authority of scripture. That's what he would say. I've got the numbers here. So out of all of these court cases that they have, this is a sample size of about 5%. So they've translated about 5%. You have 39 instances of relapses to Catholicism, which were punished. Blasphemy, 28 examples of punishments for blasphemy. A game, participating in games of chance, 36 of those. General immorality, 13 of those. Insulting French immigrants. Well, wait, wait. There's no such thing as a game of chance, Calvin. All, <laughs> of, the, all of the dice and the cards are predestined. Hilarious. Dancing and unseemly singing, 12 of them. Oh, and there's a story where there's a powerful family in Geneva and like the matriarch of that family the wife of of the powerful family member uh, is kind of probably as she was drinking dances you know in his lewdly at a wedding and he like puts her in jail amazing <laughs> uh absence from worship and catechetical instruction 10 of those Okay, so we have some of the numbers, right? Blasphemy, 28. Relapses of Calvinism, 39. Ready? Attendance for church Att must have Attendance been for phenomenal. church, 10 of ten of punishments for that, for not doing going to church. Okay, you ready for it? General disrespect and complaining about Calvin and his rule, 62. So it's the most. Now, again, mm. only 5% mm. of, they've only translated it, translated 5% of what they total what they have. But of that 5%, 62 of them, it's criticizing Calvin. Sixty-two of the how many in total? I don't. I don't know. Um, so two hundred and seventeen, and you said that was sixty what? Sixty-two. So two hundred and seventeen. Sixty-two divided by two hundred and seventeen is almost thirty percent. Almost so a third. A th so almost a third of the cases were adjudicated and punishments given out for criticizing Calvin. 62 of 217 in case we yeah. probably edit out all of the math that we just did there right. behind the scenes. <laughs> right. Okay. So this structure was in place, this consistory. All right. Now here's Servetus. You're not going to get any sympathy for Servetus from me. He was an actual heretic who denied the Trinity and denied that Jesus was God's son. He was a man who became divine to Servetus. Servetus also couldn't keep his mouth shut about it. And even after being just excommunicated by everyone, denounced by everybody, kept writing and kept talking. And he tried. He went into medicine and, and tried to leave it all behind him, but then could, could have... Could have gotten away with it, but then kept pushing the instant, the, pushing the issue. So he started, Servetus, Michael Servetus, Servetus, started a anonymous correspondence with Calvin. Just Servetus was the original Twitter troll, started writing <laughs> Calvin anonymously, but Calvin recognized him and sent him his institutes, 
This is so great. Sent him his institutes in which Servetus returned them with rude and insulting comments in the margins. <laughs> And Calvin turned that over to French papists because he knew he was in France, to the French papists who then excommunicated Servetus and basically, and then were looking for him to arrest him. So, so for some reason, the French papists cared about Calvin being insulted by Ser Servetus. No, they really. cared. No, they cared about Servetus denying the Trinity. They cared about Servetus denying that so, Jesus was the So son basically, God. in his response to Calvin of him writing insulting things he, in the margins, he already no no denials. Servetus already wrote treatises saying okay. okay. He, so he like, just sent them to him and was like, "Hey, by the way, this guy's still around. Deal with yeah. it." And they were like, "I know where he, he is. It, he's over here. Yeah. He's writing this stuff again." So to Calvin turns him in, <laughs> and Servetus flees France because of this. Um. And Servetus, on his way out of France, he because he can't help himself, apparently, he stops in Geneva and he attends church. Now, not attending church was against the law and not attending church would have been noticeable. But still, he goes to church in disguise. It doesn't work. He's recognized and he's arrested. <laughs> Servetus has like a mustache on or something and like a, a wig He's trying to come in on the disguise. And it doesn't work. So he can't, he goes to Geneva. Why? Why go there? And then you go to church. Oh, man. So uh, he is then tried and convicted, obviously. And he is convicted to be burned. So what we can say is that Calvin helped create and supported the political and religious levers by which these things happened. So he did request Servetus be beheaded instead of burned, which is super nice of him. Uh, that would have been a better way to go. But that request was denied. And like I've said, I'm sympathetic to the ideas of making immoral acts that negatively affect society illegal. And I think that's the idea behind our laws that our laws as Americans fall short of so often, but that it's at least the moral force behind our laws. So uh, I, I'm with that. I'm also understanding the historical context of what's going on here, which is that ecclesia ecclesiastical and political are the same thing. And so there is no, I, I've got a question for you after I say this. There is no world in which Calvin just invents individual human rights out of the blue. He, he I'm not, I am not putting on Calvin the moral weight that, oh, Calvin should have known about individual human rights. I'm not doing that. I, there's no, in no world was that happening. But here's my question, Drew. At what point does attempting to enforce morality cross over into religious persecution? So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna process this out loud. So basically Calvin's enforcing what he believes to be a moral, a moral society. He's enforcing what he believes to be a, a moral society, a Christian society. Adultery is illegal. Divorce is illegal. Spreading heresy is illegal. You should be punished. And in some severe cases, as perhaps would be understandable, promoting heresy, damnable heresy, then you should be killed for this. At what point does that cross into religious persecution? Um, in terms of people having differing opinions i'll say this i this is something that i've been thinking about in in response to this first of all i don't know but i think that 
what's informing some of my thinking around here and one reason why I'm why I'm perhaps not as charitable towards Calvin as you are on this on this point is that from what I understand, and I wasn't able to find this. I have a copy and paste from a, from a friend of mine on the subject with Calvin and the death penalty and how he at one stage understood. So there's the parable of the wheat and the tares where it says, don't pull out the tares with the wheat because you're likely to pull out the wheat as well. And apparently that was understood or, or can be understood as killing or destroying you know, sons of the devil, you know, these tares or whatever. And the point is, let God sort them out. If you kill them, you may end up accidentally killing some of your own brethren instead. Mm. And from what yeah. I understand, Calvin, Calvin once held to that position. <laughs> and then I guess with time and with enforcing these things and with, I don't know how many different people were killed besides a uh, servitus. But he sort of went back on that and then was defending killing her killing heretics or or specifically has defended killing servitus. Say say what you want about Calvin's being a product of his time, it was a unique circumstance and so on. Calvin very much was in favor of servitus dying. Like that was that was something that he was rubber stamp seal of approval on. Um and so I guess I would say that. I don't know. That's a good question. I guess I've just not had enough time to to think about it. I I guess I I just I'm not in that cultural mindset in the sense that It's hard to imagine. In the sense that I'm about, you know, glorifying God, seeing people come to know him, and so consequently, and and this is an interesting conversation that I was having with a brother on Twitter the other day about modesty and basically the conclusion was he had saw someone and maybe this is just you know he he's a augustinian he's a calvinist so he has this mindset and he had seen a woman in the worship service that was quite scantily clad singing in worship and stuff and he felt moved to righteous anger from his perspective that this woman needs to be told what are you doing you know, this, we're Christians here, this, and, and the way he described what she was wearing, I, I, I think, you know, if I had children with me and just in the milieu of church, I, I probably wouldn't have been very happy either. And so I kind of asked him this question about, well, would your opinion change if she wasn't a believer? You know, if you were convinced if she wasn't a believer and he said, no, I, I don't think so. And so I guess I tell that long story to basically say that, I'm of an evangelistic sharing the gospel, make disciples mind. And so I'm, and so I'm thinking, do we hold the people that aren't Christians to these mm. moral standards? And in one respect, obviously we do. You can't go and steal. You can't mm. go and kill people. Right. But there are things that we don't punish like adultery, divorce, and, and so on. And so, in Calvin's day, there was no such thing as a non-Christian. Right. Right. There is, there is, you are subject to, if you live in that city, you're subject to the laws there. I think where I would land on this, where I would land on this is Calvin, I'll, I'll say two things about this. And then maybe we can do a summary here. Calvin defended the killing of servitors and the killing of heretics in general as defending doctrine but you you're not defending a doctrine you're killing a person those are two things two different things and to equate them i think is irrational and immoral so you can say you're defending a doctrine you're killing a person so i'm not i'm not I'm trying my best not to read my contemporary lens of individual human rights. This, an idea that didn't exist until past the enlightenment, even on to Calvin. I'm not saying Calvin should have known and has Calvin is morally responsible for not knowing about individual human rights. And you don't have the right to kill someone for what they believe, which we consider to be a no brainer, duh, moral good. 
Like we, we would never say you get to kill somebody for what they believe. I bet if you surveyed <laughs> Americans, I bet 90% of them would say you don't get to kill somebody for what they believe. I'm not putting that moral force on Calvin. What I'm saying is, is that he was intellectually and morally wrong that killing a man equals defending doctrine. I don't think that's true. Two, he knew though about religious persecution. He had lived through religious persecution. He had spent his pastoral career, truly, helping out religious refugees from France. Those who had converted, converted to Lutheranism, converted to Protestantism, and had to leave their homes, leave everything they've ever known because France decided that it was a Catholic nation and Protestants weren't welcome. He knew about this. And yet, when it came to his own power, he practiced it. That's where I land on it. You can make your own call. He is a product, he is a product of his of his time. I, you know, in the same way, anyone in the future will probably look at us and say, all the dollars we spent uh, on Disney Plus supported the Uyghur genocide in China. And that's immoral. And you shouldn't give any money to Disney out of moral impetus. Could be true. I, I may be morally culpable because I pay for Disney Plus. Uh, in, in the same, similarly, because I pay my taxes, part of my taxes funds abortion, Planned Parenthood. I'm morally responsible. I'm part of a sinful system and I am tainted by that system. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Calvin is a part of this immoral system where you killed heretics and he's a part of the system in the same way that, that I am. Uh, I, I, I think that's fair. I, I don't think anybody in history, you, you, you bought a shirt in 1850, you're supporting slavery. You know, you bought you you bought a cotton shirt. You supported slavery, even if you lived in the North. So, w people in history aren't exempt from these things, and I don't hold Calvin more morally responsible than myself or others for being a part of these sinful systems. I just think on those two points, uh, he was wrong, and even in his time, ought to have known better. Okay, so here here's a, a take from a friend. So it says, Calvin wanted heretics dead. Even spoke approvingly of death for those who published things against his doctrine of predestination. Hmm, not very Christ-like. <laughs> Calvin statements pro-capital punishment for heresy. In his prefatory address to the Institutes, fear, uh, excuse me, for I fear not to declare that what I have here given may be regarded as a summary of the doctrine which they, the heretics, vociferate, ought to be punished with confiscation, exile, imprisonment, and flames, as well as exterminated land by land and sea. Oof. <laughs> here we go. In Shaft's Church History, Volume 8, Paragraph 157 from Calvin's Treatise Against Servetus, Whoever shall now contend that it is unjust to put heretics and blasphemers to death will knowingly and willingly incur their very guilt. This is not laid down on human authority. It is God who speaks and prescribes a perpetual rule for his church. So that's a, I mean, that's very much in line with what we've been discussing in terms of his, his mindset for how things are, are, um, run. So this is the interesting part here to me. In his commentary on Christ's command in Matthew 13, 30, let both grow together until the harvest. This passage has been most improperly abused by the Anabaptists and by others like them to take from the church the power of the sword. But it is easy to refute them. I shall satisfy myself with replying that Christ does not now speak of the office of pastors or of magistrates, but removes the offense which is apt to disturb weak minds when they perceive that the church is composed not only of the elect, but of the polluted dregs of society. I don't know what that means. Did you understand what he just said there? It is easy to refute them. I shall satisfy myself with replying that Christ does not now speak of the office of pastors or of magistrates, 
Oh, but like he's removed. not talking about he's not talking to individuals who have the power of the sword. But so he's just talking about but he but removes the offense which is apt to disturb weak minds when they perceive the church is composed not only of the elect. Oh, that the people that so, I'm with are not all Christians. And so that but, disturbs me. It, it sounds like what he's saying, maybe somebody can help us with this, but it sounds like what he's saying is that Christ is saying this to people who would be disturbed by this because they have weak minds, even though this is something that you're supposed to do. I don't think so. I think he's saying he's not talking about the power of the sword. Christ isn't talking about the power of the sword. Christ is talking about the people tolerating being around other people who aren't like them, aren't Christians, maybe. It's not just the elect I'm around, and that bothers me. It's like, no, let yeah. both go together until the harvest. You're going to be around people who aren't believers. You're going to be around sinful people. It, you know, it, That's to be expected that he's not talking about the power of the sword. That's how I take Interesting. it. Interesting. Okay. And then, and then this is in his letter, 389, papers and books of his Castalion, a heretic, in which an attempt was made to impugn our doctrine touching predestination have been condemned with a prohibition to publish them on pain of death. So if you, if you talk bad about our doctrine of predestination, we'll kill you. <laughs> <laughs> Responsio ad al Balduini convincia opera. Is that a nine, five, seven, five? Yeah. Anyways, why am I reading this all? You can, you guys can pause it and then look this up yourself if you want to look at the source. Okay. Anyways, Servetus suffered the penalty due to his heresies, but but was it my will? Certainly, his arrogance destroyed him, not less than his impiety. And what crime was it of mine if if our counsel at my exhortation, indeed, at my exhortation, indeed? So this is what I was talking about. Like he, he's yeah. obviously in favor right. of this but in conformity with the opinion of several churches took vengeance on his ex execrable blasphemies let balduin abuse me as long as he will provided that by the judgment of melanchthon posterity owes me a debt of gratitude for having purged the church of so pernicious a monster oof yeah it, it seems to me that his Services arrogance did kill him as much as anything else because he, he couldn't stop talking about it, couldn't stop writing Calvin, couldn't stop putting himself around Calvin, around Geneva, where he knew this stuff was illegal. He knew he'd be arrested. Like, Right. And, and I think based on what I've learned, I, I would agree that he he was being pretty persistent and stuff like that. It's interesting because I know some – anyways – we won't get into that. I was just going to say, it seems like there are differing views on what Servetus, Servetus, however you say his name, believed and didn't believe. But but there you have it. Some quotes from, from Calvin himself. And it's, uh, I guess the point of that Matthew 13 commentary is that he's aware of Anabaptists and others that would say, Jesus is here teaching, don't do that. And then he's like, yes. nah, that's not he's he's is. He's aware the, of religious persecution, of people who have fleed it, of people who are suffering from it, and he decided to perpetuate it. And and that, to me, is what he's morally uh, responsible for. And, and you, you, you can't hear me saying that Calvin is morally responsible for violating his services to human rights. Like, that's not what I'm saying. There are no, there's no human rights back then. Yeah, if, and, if anything, we would just say out of what is revealed for being Christ-like and Christ's commands in scripture, he is accountable. And it certainly seems as though there is, there is strong evidence to suggest he should have known based on this parable and other areas, love your enemies and stuff that you're not going to kill someone for being a heretic, but yeah. And, and, right. And so w with the humility, knowing that, if I lived in that time, I would be just as much a product of that sinful system as any one of you and any one of us would be. But just like I'm the product of whatever sinful systems I'm in now. Uh, but yeah, so without, without being revisionist about it and just looking at the contemporary situation, the cultural context and historical context that this was happening in, uh, Calvin didn't need to 
support killing heretics. That's, that's not something he needed to do. So, Drew, you asked me this question. Is it a little bit clearer now how, how the the world developed in such a way that a French lawyer could gain power in a Swiss town uh, separate from the power of the papacy and gain the power of the sword such that he was influential as to the punishments given out to people. Uh, does that make more sense? I think so. If I could summarize, I think I would say that Calvin was very educated. He was very competent. He had already established himself as a well-reasoned, biblically centered mind, at least from the perspective of those that were approving of his writings. And then he ended up perhaps providentially, I don't know, in, at the right time, at the right place, at the right time with the right skills such that, hey, stick around, help us write these laws, help us, you know, I mean, bring reforms, essentially bring, re bring the reestablish reform. Christ's yeah. kingdom, you know, and, and be his magistrates uh, adjudicating for, for his righteousness here on earth and in, in our society. And then uh, I think the biggest takeaway to me in this that, that I have running in my head is, in my opinion, this is just kind of my opinion based on what I know about how all this happened and Calvin's age and stuff like that. There is the qualification of elders in 1 Timothy, 2, 1 Timothy 3, and it talks about let not let them not be a, a young convert or a new convert or whatever, basically, lest they fall into the same snare as the devil. And I, I think that Calvin was a little bit too young and a little bit too educated for the influence that he gathered so quickly. And this is just kind of my opinion is that I think that just got to him in time. And then to a point where he's receiving critics critiques and he's, he's like, nah, I'm going to, I'm going to punish you for that because I have, you know, I have the influence to do so. So, um, certainly not chucking out the baby with the bathwater. I mean, I think that, uh, Obviously, those of you that knows, know us and have been listening to this channel, we are not Calvinists and are no friends of the system of Calvinism. And so we have a lot of bones to pick with Calvin and his doctrine of predestination, which predestination is very biblical doctrine. Yeah. As, aside from our own bones to pick with him, we're just trying to approach things, hopefully relatively objectively not go scorched earth on him and just, and there are things that he's written that I've read that you would sign your name next to, right. In the, right. in the, his commentaries and different stuff. And then there are other things that you're like, uh, which I think is a healthy way to approach theology, to approach reading anyone. And I would love to see a little bit more objective agreement from our Calvinistic brethren on the things that he got wrong and the things that he did wrong than to just defend him blindly but and, and i think uh, and my, I know not everyone is like that but that seems to be often the response to these issues so right right and, and my takeaway from this or i hope what other people's takeaway from, from this is is that how these things developed was the product of a different world that we don't understand and that this was the historical events that helped our world to become what it is and we need to be careful not to put our contemporary concerns back on it. We need to try to understand it for its own sake. Uh, and then we can understand how and why, and to some degree, we can understand how and why these things happened, how these things developed. And it isn't as, it isn't just this pure, oh, we just returned to the gospel and it's so amazing. Yeah, it came out of a time of upheaval, came out of a time of suffering. It was just as much political as it was anything else. Luther's 95 theses were just as much sedition, political sedition as they were anything else. It was just as much political and social concerns as it was theological. And uh, we have to understand those things in, in their full context and not uh, whitewash them and not contemporize them. Uh, and and I, I, I love doing historical studies like this, uh, kind of a nerd in that way. And, and so if you, you like this kind of thing, let us know, comment below. You want us to do to do Luther? You want us to do some of these other things? I would love to do that. 
Thanks for listening or watching. If you've made it all to the all the way to the end, I'm impressed. You're one of our choice meets. You're one of our choice of viewers. We appreciate you. Let us know that you uh, made it to the end in the comments below. We'll give you a like, a thumbs up. If you really enjoy this content and want to take us out to a cup of coffee, you can join our patron team and help with all the things that it takes to make this go. Uh, and we really appreciate it. You can, and then you would join our Discord and uh, get to have uh, back behind the scenes conversations with us. Uh, we discuss online shenanigans and ideas ideas for the podcast. So thanks for making it this far, and we'll see you next time on the Provisionist Perspective.